Cool. So, I spent a long time making this slide, so I hope you like it. <laughs> We're talking today, uh, I'm, I'm going to talk briefly about uh, some real-world serverless use cases. Um, again, my name is David Wells. You can follow me there on Twitter, and feel free to tweet at me anytime, day or night, serverless questions. So, how many, how many people here are full-stack developers? Okay, a lot of people. Front-end people? Anybody? Okay. Any DevOps people in the crowd? Cool, cool. Welcome, welcome. Um, awesome. How many people here have uh, heard of AWS Lambda? Okay, everybody. You're in the right place. You're in the right place. Like, how many people here are, are intimately familiar with these guys uh, or has had to configure one of those, uh, make sure that it's load balanced, make sure that the software is up to date? Uh, yeah, a lot of people here. Cool, cool. Um, Awesome. So yeah, and then obviously you guys have heard of serverless. You're here. Uh, this is typically the reaction we get when we're talking about serverless technology. Uh, there's this skeptical look on people's faces, and then the inevitable question is, there's a server somewhere. And yes, that is true, uh, but really at the end of the day, uh, it's out of sight, out of mind. You don't really need to worry about that. You can kind of focus uh, on your business application and your business logic. Uh, so this is the reaction I typically get, and then really on Twitter, this is the reaction that <laughs> we get all the time. Uh, you know, again, uh, at the end of the day, um, you know, there are servers somewhere, but I would, I would, uh, this is one of my favorite kind of comebacks to that, you know, is wireless internet truly wireless? I can guarantee you there's a router somewhere with a wire plugged into it. Uh, and is the cloud actually a cloud? I'm not sure about that one, but... <laughs> Maybe. Cool. Um, but yeah, really, quite simply put, it's like ser the whole idea of serverless is running your code on demand, um, amongst other things that we'll get into. And you know, some of the largest tech giants out there, uh, Amazon, Microsoft, IBM, and Google, who we have here tonight, uh, is offer are offering these compute services, um, which are, are pretty good. Um, and yeah, the, the kind of the, the base concepts behind like a serverless um, architecture or an event-driven architecture is taking a microservices approach, um, you know, out of the box, they auto scale for you. You don't need to worry about uh, that stuff that we used to back in the day. Um, the pricing model is, is very compellingly different, um, which is a pay per execution pricing model. So no longer are you going to be pay, paying for idle resources. You only pay uh, based off the per mil millisecond execution time. Um, there's this concept of, you know, everything is event driven or most things are event driven, uh, which we'll dive into a little bit. And then uh, it's really about focusing on uh, your application, not the infrastructure underneath it uh, or some of the concerns that come with that. So uh, quite simply put, it's, you know, you writing your code as per usual, uh, deploying that up to a cloud provider of your choice. <laughs> All right, we've got some Rocket fans in the crowd. Uh, and then, uh, yeah, only paying for uh, when it's actually running. Um, so this is uh, the Lambda pricing model. All the providers have very similar pricing, um, where basically the first million uh, um, executions are free per month, and then uh, it's 20 cents per million after that. So very compelling from a cost perspective. And behind the scenes, it'll scale for you, um, so you don't need to worry about that. And this makes everyone a happy camper. Am I right? All right. Some people aren't happy campers yet. All right. So yeah. So when I first heard about this whole idea, uh, this really spoke to me um, because uh, I was going down uh, a rabbit hole of learning like really, really a deep, you know, Docker setup, setting up Kubernetes clusters, etc. Where I really all I wanted to do was actually build my app uh, to actually provide value to my end users. So this whole kind of serverless uh, movement kind of resonated with me. The question that we always get is like, what does serverless Inc actually do? What do like, where does that actually fit into the picture? Um, really the whole serverless ecosystem is, is really like that functions as a service model, um, kind of like I mentioned, uh, you know, compute on demand. Um, what we do is uh, we actually, we have an open source framework to CLI that lets you uh, easily deploy your code to any cloud provider of your choosing. 
It's basically your code plus the serverless uh, command line interface uh, plus your provider of choice uh, equals, you know, uh, all those things that I just mentioned equals, you know, an infinitely scalable ap application that you don't really need to uh, worry as much about um, at the end of the day. You can do it without uh, using a framework, um, but it's rather hard to wire all those things up, especially if you're taking a microservices uh, type approach where you're building out many, many services that do one thing and they do them very well. Um, you know, uh, zipping up a your code and wiring up all the API endpoints and what have you uh, becomes very unscalable uh, as you progress. So we highly recommend using some sort of framework to do this. Um, and real quickly, this is what the actual serverless framework looks like. You have a handler.js, a server, uh, serverless.yaml, which is the config, uh, and basically the serverless.yaml config file is uh, where I want my code to run. So in this example, uh, it's AWS. So I'm saying I want this to run in AWS's cloud. Again, it could be any of the other providers. Um, then what to run? Uh, so in this case, I'm referencing a handler.js fi handler file. Uh, and then when I want it to actually run. So this is that kind of event-driven paradigm that I was talking about. Uh, this example here is responding to a post, an HTTP post event, so like a backend API. Um, and then this second example is basically uh, running a, f a function make thumbnail uh, when uh, a new item is added to an S3 bucket. So a new image gets uploaded to the bucket, that automatically triggers the Lambda to resize it and make the thumbnail. And then just real quickly, the code, again, it's, it's how many people are Node developers? Cool. Python people? Nice. Uh, Java, anybody? OK, nice. Welcome. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you, you really can write in uh, you know, any language of your choosing. Uh, all the providers are adding more and more support for different languages. And there are shims for, for multiple languages out there, including Swift and Go and you, know, you name it. Uh, but yeah, this is basically just really simple node code that uh, is putting a user uh, into a database. Uh, and you'll notice back on the serverless.yaml, this is the actual function that uh, the code is referencing. And then uh, basically, the framework packages it all up, puts it in the cloud, and exposes those endpoints. So that's, in a nutshell, what the framework does. Um, and that makes me a happy camper, because I no longer have to like wire everything together. Uh, it just makes things um, super simple. So. Um, yeah, and, and back to this, so your code runs uh, when the events are triggered. So some examples of that would maybe be a post request like I just showed. Um, a new item is added to a database. So like a new user is created in your database, you want to maybe send them a welcome email. That uh, before you would have to kind of wire up that logic yourself. But now with this kind of event driven approach, you can just simply have a Lambda function sitting there, not costing you anything, and it, you only get billed when it actually runs. Um, ske scheduled cron triggers, which is a really uh, good use case. Um, I use this all the time. Uh, a new image is uh, added into an S3 bucket. Um, basically, you can react to that, resize it. It doesn't have to be an image. It could be a video file. It could be any type of file. Um, and you can react to that. Anything you can put into a bucket. Um, so there's also a bunch of different events that, uh, infrastructure events that can trigger functions. So if you're listening to CloudWatch events or a new EC2 instances spun up or what have you, and we'll go into that in a little bit here. Uh, and then also a really common use case, I use this all the time as well, uh, is uh, so if a SaaS webhook is fired, so GitHub webhook, you know, a new commit on your repository, you could listen f uh, to that webhook and react to it with a Lambda function, where again, before you would need to set up a specific server to just run idly waiting for that webhook to hit it. Now you can set up you know, an infinite amount of these, um, and they only, again, you're only billed when it actually runs. Um, and then another quick example would be like, you know, a link is clicked in an email, you wanna listen to it, yeah. We're gonna jump into a lot of different use cases. Tons and tons and tons of use cases. Uh, really, uh, the way that I describe it is you can really do everything with serverless with an asterisk. And that asterisk is 
There is a limitation right now with uh, functions as a service providers, which you can only run code um, that executes under within a five minute window. So if you have really, really, really long running processes, uh, server, uh, running that in a serverless function, it's not really for you. Uh, you could, however, use a Lambda function to spin up an EC2 instance or what have you, do the long running job, then trigger another Lambda function to return the data. But, you know, uh, yeah. And then the other uh, kind of thing that's a little bit tricky right now is uh, dealing with uh, web sockets. You can do it, uh, but it's, it's a little bit trickier than it needs to be, uh, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, so uh, really common use cases. Uh, we use these all the time. So web and mobile backends. I showed a post example, post git, you know, delete, patch, etc. cetera. Uh, we use uh, internally at serverless for the products we're building out. Um, we use a GraphQL Lambda function, uh, so a single endpoint that kind of fans out and grabs back data for our UI. Um, we use, uh, so you can do, use form processing, so on our site, all of our contact forms are basically just Lambda functions sitting there waiting for uh, you know, people to contact us. Um, image processing, like I mentioned, uh, another common use case uh, that we see is uh, web scraping or uh, testing. So, <coughs> excuse me. So you can run uh, binary um, files in a Lambda function, just like you could in Node. Uh, you do need to compile it to the specific environment that like Lambda or any of the other providers run on. But an example of this would be running PhantomJS, you know, plugging in a URL, doing something, and returning back data. So like instead of just returning um, JSON from an API request, you can actually return back uh, HTML or any other dynamic binary. So uh, if you need a dynamic image to return back from a, a call or uh, one of the use cases I saw was like returning back a dynamic SVG for like a GitHub ba uh, badge to add like a dynamic count to it. Um, and then if you wanted to, and we actually do this on serverless.com. So serverless.com is a completely static website. Uh, we did need um, a dynamic route though. So we actually have a Lambda function that uh, is just sitting there listening, connected to a Dynamo table. When that route gets hit, um, it basically hits that Lambda function and returns back uh, dynamically generated HTML. And like I mentioned, webhook listeners, uh, tons and tons of SaaS companies like expose webhooks. Um, and I would, I would guesstimate that a lot of companies are actually going to like expand on this offering where not only offering webhooks, but actually offering functions and like custom integration points for you to write your own code. Um, but yeah, and, uh, cron jobs, like I mentioned, so we use like a ton of cron jobs at serverless. Uh, I use a ton of them like in my personal life as well for things that I just want to automate. Um, uh, but so we have a cron. Uh, we needed a way to schedule blog posts for our static site, which, uh, you know, if you've built a static site, you know, everything like you merge stuff into master, then the site rebuilds itself. Merging something on GitHub is a manual process. But uh, with the use of a cron job and webhook listeners, we can actually uh, automate that. So we have a cron running every hour. Um, so it runs, what is that? I think it's like 720 times a month. Math is hard, but um, yeah. So instead of having like a server basically sitting there monthly that we're paying like five to eight bucks a month for doing that one tiny thing, uh, it's you know basically free. So, uh, and then like I mentioned, DevOps automation, um, and we'll go into a real life use case of that. Um, infrastructure events I mentioned. So triggering based off uh, you know home automation things like Alexa. So like the echo we're giving away, you could trigger Lambda functions with custom skills um, and uh, Internet of Things. And uh, my least favorite, but must be on here is bots. Not a fan of bots, but yeah. <laughs> um, and this is, this is one of my uh, favorite kind of cutesy examples. Uh, to show which, but I show this because it, it, it illustrates the event driven kind of nature of, of things. So uh, John C. McKim uh, wrote this uh, quick, funny app that basically reacts to an S3 bucket when an image is added in. That triggers a Lambda function, which uh, talks to Amazon's recognition service to do facial matching, puts an emoji on people's faces and returns that image. So 
silly, but um, you could real you could you know kind of extrapolate on this and see like what you could actually do in your app if you have like a social app or what have you, automatic tagging, etc. Um, some of the infrastructure events that I mentioned, this is more AWS specific. Uh, all the providers are very similar um, where they expose different events that you can react to. Um, but yeah, I'm not gonna go through all these. Uh, there's a link and these, this, these slides will be available later. Um, but yeah, there's a ton of things that you can react to. It's for our actual site. So, and, and all of our marketing stuff, all of our blog stuff. Uh, we use uh, Lambda functions for all these things. So web forms, like I mentioned, custom APIs, uh, also authenticated APIs. Uh, so we're using uh, Auth0 for user authentication, which gives us a JSON web token. You can add a custom authorizer function to basically validate that this is an actual user, give them back the data that they need. Um, new user welcome emails. Lead revisit notifications for like our marketing stuff. We want to know when you come back, et cetera. Um, and then this, is, uh, this isn't actually implemented, but it's something that I'm working on, showing related content on our blog. Uh, we, this is, uh, we also use, we use Algolia for site search. So the, the serverless movement, the concept of serverless is, again, focusing on your business's core concepts and not, um, not reinventing the wheel, so it would be crazy for us to basically, you know, recreate search or recreate user auth or recreate, uh, let's say we were sending text messages to users or emails, like Twilio exists, SendGrid exists, there's, there's, there's tools to plug into so that the concept of serverless is also one that is serviceful. So there are things that you can plug into to move faster. And then another thing I'm working on right now is uh, actually getting doc feedback. So that would just be like in our UI, was this documentation helpful, yes or no? Which just pings a Lambda function and stores uh, basically the score of that particular um, doc page. Cool, so let's look at some uh, additional kind of examples um, and like the actual architecture of what it looks like. So this would be an example of a backend API for a UI. This is uh, going through API Gateway. There's three different Lambda functions that are all talking to a single Dynamo table. <clears throat> There's a project on our site. If you actually uh, go to the framework section of our site, there's, a, there's basically a Kanban board that pulls in all the GitHub issues and what have you uh, of our community, um, displays them on there. That's actually kind of this uh, architecture. Uh, and that is an open source project if you want to fork it or use it or learn from it. This is a backend API, a little bit more expanded, um, where basically, uh, you know, we have an API gateway with some Lambda functions with also reacting to a couple of S3 events. Uh, and this is also tying into uh, an email service to send uh, welcome emails to people. And then even more complex, um, but just kind of illustrating that you can build you know, uh, basically larger event-driven systems. Um, this is a project called Moonmail, which Moonmail, I think it's moonmail.io, which is basically recreating like MailChimp with serverless functions. We're basically, uh, by doing this, and I'm, I, I can almost guarantee that this is gonna happen for almost every SaaS product out there, there's going to be a serverless uh, implementation of it that is far cheaper than its nearest competitor. So Moonmail is like, crazy, crazy cheaper than any other mailing service, um, unless you're uh, tying directly into a provider's um, option. Uh, this is uh, the example of the kind of webhook listener. So um, here we're just listening to GitHub webhooks. Um, again, going through API Gateway, uh, triggering a function that uh, knows what to do with the uh, webhook payload, and then that's storing into a Dynamo table. Uh, this is actually the uh, post scheduler that I was talking about. Uh, there's a link to the repo down below, all open source. Um, another uh, real world example is uh, the US Department of Defense uh, used some of my code. And I was like, when I got an email about this, I was like, what? <laughs> and then I told my dad and then my dad said, how much, how much do they pay you? It's like. Yeah, dad, it's open source. It's open source code, dad. 
Yeah, anyways, um, they actually, they uh, forked the um, GitHub webhook listener uh, example. If you go to github.com slash serverless slash examples, there are uh, just a ton, a ton of different use cases that I'm mentioning, sample code, et cetera. So they forked that, uh, and, the, and the way that they're using that is actually uh, to, what is it? Uh, Tom, yeah, Tom over at the Department of Defense, uh, dig Defense Digital Services at the Pentagon. I'm going to put this on my resume, I swear. <laughs> Uh, they basically are using it to validate uh, the developers that are contributing to their projects. I guess there's it's code.mil, and they're they're doing some open source stuff, and it's basically to add a developer certificate of origin to the actual commit to ensure that uh, yeah they're correctly attributing people that are improving software for citizens. So that's pretty cool. Uh, it's not shooting missiles. That would be crazy, but I would not approve of that. Um, yeah, and then here's another uh, quick example of, uh, yeah, this is just the, the kind of cron job uh, of the post scheduler just running every hour. It checks the database and checks the timestamp uh, of that item uh, to see if anything's expired, and then if it is, it'll do something with it. Um, really, really simple to set up, um, stuff like that. The, this is an example of uh, setting up a screenshot service with Lambda. So this is using PhantomJS to take screenshots uh, and implement it in their application. It's a good blog post on that. Um, and this isn't just for kind of like tiny uh, toy projects. There are a lot of uh, enterprise users that are using Lambda and other providers in production today. Um, one of them is uh, Nordstrom. Nordstrom has some really cool applications that they're doing. So they have a, they have a project called uh, Artillery, or it's serverless artillery, where basically when they deploy, they, they have over 200 lambdas in production today. When they deploy uh, you know, updates and what have you, they use this project called Artillery to basically hammer the function and to do security auditing on it to make sure that everything is uh, you know, kosher. And then Coca-Cola is another um, user um, and framework contributor, but they they actually use uh, a lot of uh, Lambda functions for serving back dynamic uh, web pages for marketing campaigns, because when you get like massively spotty traffic, um, you know, using a Lambda uh, can really help with that. You don't really need to worry about the scale of that. Uh, highly recommend checking out the Serverless State of the Union 2016. There's a ton of like uh, real like huge companies and use cases there. Um, shout out to Tim Wagner for that. Uh, one of those was uh, the f uh, financial regulation like industry. I guess it's not part of the government, but it's a um, basically a financial regulation um, company. They're processing like massive, massive, massive number of events through Lambda. And then some other examples from uh, some of the, the larger companies that we've talked to. Um, so like I mentioned, Coca-Cola is built it, using it for marketing sites. Nike's using Lambda for uh, e-commerce auth. Servata, which is like a survey company uh, if you, uh, to survey ad effectiveness. Um, if you've seen an ad, they'll survey you after the fact to see how effective it was. But this is, so this is like third party JavaScript running on like massive, massive sites. So they're, they're using Lambda to actually cookie people uh, and um, process, you know, the, the survey results. Uh, and there's a good talk actually on that uh, from the AWS loft here. I, I believe it was videotaped. Yeah. And like I mentioned, uh, Nordstrom is, uh, using it for a ton of different things, uh, as well as kind of that DevOps automation piece, making sure that uh, the security is in place for the Lambda functions and to make sure that uh, it will, will actually scale. So with that, that's a ton of different examples, covered a lot of stuff. Uh, I want to open it up to questions. I guess you would have to set up some sort of logic uh, to see the throughput, if you're ma like reaching a certain number of throughput, uh, which I believe you could do with CloudWatch events, uh, you could basically swap the traffic from that EC2 instance to your Lambda endpoints. You would need some sort of like 
kind of uh, routing mechanism in front of that. But yeah, that's absolutely what you could do. Uh, another really interesting kind of use case, and this is a DevOps automation piece. There's a, so like, who here uses DynamoDB? Great, okay, a couple of people. So it doesn't auto scale for you, but there's a project that basically does this. It watches for the throughput. When it reaches uh, you know, 80% uh, of capacity, it will then uh, trigger a Lambda function to uh, scale up the read write capacity. And then since you can only scale down Dynamo four times a day, it will check four times a day to, are we over? Okay, scale down. So like, there's, there's absolutely like a way that you could do that. Yeah, so you can do it that way, but then you're replicating that logic in all of your functions. So with, uh, it's actually in our uh, examples repository. Um, uh, it's, I think it's like the auth zero example or whatever, but basically when you make it, put it into its own authorizer function, you can attach that uh, at the service level or the function level. Uh, it'll also like cache the validation like, um, yeah, it's basically so you don't repeat logic everywhere is what I would say.